Hi, I'm Chili Dilly, the personality pickle. Packed in a jar for the freshest flavor. Served cold in a sack for you to savor. So dainty to eat, no muss, no fuss. An ideal snack for all of us. Crisp, tender, and tasty with a bit of spice. Buy one now. Taste how nice. Snack bar clerks will knock themselves silly. Speeding your order for a real Chili Dilly. special edition of Cleveland Classic Cinema. Our movie today is 1963's The Sadist, directed by James Landis. I have been hurt by others, and I will hurt them. I will make them suffer like I have suffered. The words of a sadist, one of the most disruptive elements in human society. To have complete mastery over another, to make him a helpless object, to humiliate him, to enslave, to inflict moral insanity on the innocent. That is his objective, his twisted pleasure. You know, being on TV, even on a crummy little public access show like this one, has its advantages. First of all, it's less embarrassing than appearing on, say, Jerry Springer and confessing that not only am I sleeping with my brother's girlfriend, but that I got her mother pregnant and she's expecting Siamese twin hermaphrodites. Not much less embarrassing, but a little. Secondly, every once in a while I meet somebody who actually watches the show and enjoys it. That's always a nice thing, you know, because it's good to know that the incredible amount of labor I put into these intros is compensated by the knowledge that my viewers enjoy listening to them and find them interesting and or educational. It's really gratifying because, believe me, when I get paid for doing this... Hey. All right, sorry. The third thing is that I get to communicate with people that share my love of movies. Not only classics, but also bottom of the barrel dreck, and I love doing that. Not only do I get to show off my geek-like knowledge of things sane people care absolutely nothing about, but I also get to share laughs with fellow bad film addicts. The fourth thing is that I get to see, or in some cases I'm forced to watch, Movies I'd otherwise never take in. This can be a drawback as well, since watching movies such as Please Murder Me can be incredibly painful, but for my faithful viewers, I'm willing to make the sacrifice. The really great thing about this part of it is that sometimes I see a movie that I have low expectations for, and it turns out that I was mistaken in my sight unseen assessment. The Sadist is a perfect example of this. This movie doesn't exactly have what you'd call a great pedigree. If you've ever seen Ega or Wild Guitar, when you hear the name Arch Hall Jr., you kind of go, Mee! He's not at all bad in this film, relatively speaking, although his limp seems to come and go without warning and his maniacal giggle is taken straight from Richard Woodmark's performance of Tommy Udo in Kiss of Death. He's also a bit tall for the role, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Shortcomings notwithstanding, however, he's not bad in this movie, providing the audience with a hate-filled and hateful villain. Now, if you study this movie, instead of just taking it in, you'll notice something about it that's not usual with, with movies of this type. The cinematography. Films made by Arch Hall Sr. were usually crewed by whomever would work inexpensively without regard to the amount of talent they possessed, which is one of the many drawbacks to low-budget filmmaking. But on this one, they got lucky and hooked up with a cinematographer named Vilmos Zygmunt. Vilmos Zygmunt was born on June 16, 1930 in Zeged, Hungary, developing an interest in photography during his teens. After graduating from st the State University of Motion Picture and Theater Arts in Budapest, the Hungarian Revolution started, and before escaping the country, he and fellow st film student Laszlo Kovacs shot footage of the Soviet invasion and sold it to American television upon coming to this country. Making contacts with other cinematographers in Hollywood, he began his career in earnest, moving from low-budget features produced by Arch Hall, like this one, and others directed by Ray Dennis Steckler, such as the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies, and made his mark with films such as Robert Altman's McCabe and Mrs. Miller, John Borman's Deliverance, Michael Cimino's The Deer Hunter, and Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 
for which he was awarded a very much deserved Oscar. He still works today and shares his knowledge with aspiring cinematographers in a two-week course on lighting he teaches in Hungary every year. The reason I mentioned that Arch Hall was a bit tall for the role is because the plot of the status is based very loosely on the exploits of Charles Starkweather and his girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugate. Charles Starkweather was born on November 24, 1938 in Lincoln, Nebraska. The third of seven children, he grew up in poverty, but he never went hungry as his parents were hardworking people and gave him a decent childhood. His school life was traumatic for him, however. He was frequently teased for being short, being only five foot two inches tall, but he was very strong for his size. He constantly got into fights with other boys, and one of the boys he fought, Bob Van Bush, conversely became his best friend. He remembered, Charlie could be the kindest person you've ever seen. He'd do anything for you if he liked you. He was a hell of a lot of fun to be around, too. Everything was just one big joke to him. But he had this other side. He could be mean as hell, cruel. If he saw some poor guy on the street who was bigger than he was, better looking or better dressed, he tried to take the poor bastard down to his size. A James Dean fanatic, he took to dressing like his idol in tight jeans and cowboy boots. In 1956, he met Carol Ann Fugate when Bob Van Bush started dating her sister, Barbara. Although Carol was only 13 at the time, they double dated with Bob and Barbara constantly. Carol was a good match for Charlie. She was rebellious and had a short temper as well, and he worshipped her. Carol, in turn, was impressed by Charlie's image and the fact that, despite his poverty, he managed to give her whatever she wanted. After Carol got into a minor accident driving Charlie's hot rod, Charlie and his father, who as co-owner of the rod had to pay for the damage to the other car, had an argument and Charlie was kicked out of the house. He found work as a garbage man for about 40 bucks a week, which was not enough to support himself, much less himself and Carol. He became more and more angry at the world, seeing crime as his only way out of the poverty he seemed locked into. The last straw was when he attempted to buy a stuffed animal for Carol at a gas station, found he didn't have enough money to buy it, and the attendant wouldn't allow him to take it on credit. He went back to the filling station the next day, robbed the place, then kidnapped and murdered the attendant. When the police failed to connect him with the crime, he came, be, became convinced that he was bulletproof. A couple of weeks later, Charlie murdered Carol's entire family, shooting her father in the head, her mother in the face, and cutting her baby sister's throat. He dumped Carol's mother and sister's bodies in the outhouse and her father's body in the chicken coop. They then lived together in the house for nearly a week, turning away people who came to visit by hanging a sign on the door saying everyone had the flu. When the police finally investigated after repeated complaints from members of the family, they found Charlie and Carol gone. Out of desperation, the two went to the farm of an old friend, August Meyer, whom Charlie murdered. They robbed the house and then went to sleep in his bedroom. When their car got stuck in the mud of Meyer's drive, they abandoned it, taking the money and the guns they'd stolen. Hitching a ride with two teenagers, Carol King and Robert Jensen, they kidnapped the two, took them back to the Meyer farm, and murdered them in the storm cellar. They then drove back to Lincoln, Charlie's hometown. His abandoned car was discovered at the Meyer farm along with the bodies of his victims, and the two became the target of a statewide search. They invaded the home of C. Lower Ward, president of the Capitol Bridge and Capitol Steel Companies, murdering Mrs. Ward, her maid Lillian Fence, and finally Ward himself. After this, Charlie sat down and penned a semi-literate letter to the law trying to justify his killing rampage, blaming everyone but himself. When the bodies were discovered, the governor, a personal friend of Ward, called out the National Guard and started a house-by-house -house search. Meanwhile, Charlie and Carol drove all night in Ward's stolen Packard, stealing the car of and killing Merle Collison, a shoe salesman. When Charlie couldn't figure out how to release the parking brake on the car, he flagged down a passing motorist. When he pulled a gun on the man, they began to struggle for it, and William Romer, a Wyoming deputy sheriff, stopped to investigate. Carol, figuring the jig was up, ran to him, abandoning Charlie, and Charlie took off in the car. After a chase, Charlie pulled over and gave up. Flying glass during the chase had cut his ear, and he thought he was bleeding to death. During the trial, Charlie and Carol turned against one another, Carol saying that he did all the killing and Charlie claiming that Carol participated. He ended up getting the chair and Carol got life imprisonment, being paroled in June of 1976. This story was a very touchy subject throughout the 50s, so touchy that no movie studio would consider it, 
which is kind of strange considering the plethora of ripped from the headlines crap you're seeing on TV nowadays. The Sadist was the first version of this story filmed, although more would follow over the years. Terrence Malick's Badlands with Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek, David Lynch's Wild at Heart with Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern, and Tony Scott's True Romance with Christian Slater and Patricia Arquette, to name a few. Arch Hall Sr. was born on December 21, 1908, in Missouri. He produced, wrote, directed, acted in, and composed music for over 26 movies during his career, most of them featuring his son, Arch Hall Jr. He was apparently quite the natural con artist, and during a stint in the Army Air Force, he became friends with William Bowers, a fellow pilot who later wrote the screenplay for Jack Webb's 1961 film, The Last Time I Saw Archie, basing it on his experiences with Hall Sr. Hall Sr. was apparently not amused, and he sued for invasion of privacy, eventually get settling out of court. He died of a heart attack on April 28, 1978, in Los Angeles, California. Arch Hall Jr. was born on December 2, 1943, in Los Angeles, California. He was pretty much forced into an acting career by his father, Arch Hall Sr., who probably didn't want to have to pay an actor to appear in his films. His first movie was 1961's The Choppers, a film about a gang of teenage car strippers with Arch Jr. starting a disturbing trend by supplying songs for the movie, which resulted in an ongoing debate about the lyrics, Monkeys in my hat band, I can do a handstand. His next film was the infamous Ega, the name written in blood, co-starring Marilyn Manning, who also appears in The Sadist, and Richard Keel, who eventually went on to bigger and better things in movies, appearing in 32 television shows and 46 films, such as The Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds, in addition to appearing as the villain Jaws in several James Bond films. Arch Jr. also sang a few songs in Ega as well. The unforgettable Vicky, the vitamin ballad Valerie, and the all-time rocker, The House on Brownsville Road. Here's a trailer. From ancient Genesis to the modern screen, is the name written in blood, Ega. If I could just call you on the phone. The code of the ghost, that's the sign of the toad. Nobody lives on the Brownsville Road. Thrilled to the newest recording star, Arch Hall Jr. Oh, the scream in this way. See ravishing Marilyn Manning in a thrilling, chilling story. <laughs> the last of the prehistoric giants sees his first girl, Noah. Curious newsmen search deep in giant country for the last of the ancient cavemen. See a tough giant tamed by the soft hands of his captive woman. See him sacrifice his ageless beard for her love. They lose her to a boy in a dune buggy, escaping a burning desert. Ega's primitive passion was love or kill. <laughs> The ancient language of love, used at the beginning of time. Ega. This was followed by Wild Guitar, yet another movie showcasing Arch Jr.'s singing talents. This one about a kid who wants to be a singing sensation and becomes one despite the moronic lyrics of his songs. Ray Dennis Steckler, who later graced the world with the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies, which should go down in history for the title alone, directed this one and also appears in it as Steak, the big guy's major domo. Here's a trailer for that one. This mad, mad town, Hollywood. Now look, kid, let's get something straight right now. 
You're the one that wants to be a star, not me. You don't love me anymore. Oh, hit me. An all-American boy sings his way into your hearts. Like thousands of kids who come to Hollywood every year, see Arch Hall Jr. in the swingingest musical action picture of the year. I'm getting all the time. We can't have that. He wants a girl. Get one for him. Nothing could shake him from his goal. Not even easy. Frenzy of music and action. From Fairway International Films, the swingingest picture of the year, see Arch Hall Jr. and Nancy Zarr in Wild Guitar. His next film was The Sadist, followed by 1964's The Nasty Rabbit, and 1965's Deadwood 76. After that, Arch Hall Jr. retired from films and became a pilot, which is what he really wanted to do. It's all for the best, actually. He was never much of an actor, and to tell the truth, he resembles the offspring of a troll doll and a Cabbage Patch Kid. Marilyn Manning, who appears in this film as Judy Bradshaw, the Carol Ann Fugate character, appeared in three movies during her brief career. Ega, The Sadist, and 1964's What's Up Front is Candy Cotton. What's Up Front was about a door-to-door -door bra salesman and is about as good as it sounds. She was an attractive young lady, but unfortunately her acting talent didn't match her looks. I was unable to find any biographical inf information on her. Don Russell was actually the production manager on The Sadist and it was his only film as an actor. Helen Hovey, who plays Doris, the lady school teacher, appeared in this movie and never acted again. She was Arch Hall Sr.'s niece, which makes the scenes of Arch Hall Jr. slobbering all over her a little uncomfortable to watch, unless maybe you're from West Virginia. Richard Alden, probably the best actor in this movie, appeared in 15 movies and 7 television shows during his career. He's probably best remembered for appearing in 1966's The Glass Bottom Boat, which isn't much to brag about. I have to confess, I had no desire whatsoever to see The Sadist. If you've seen one Arch Hall Jr. movie, the urge to see another one isn't exactly what you'd call overpowering. But thanks to two of my more faithful viewers, Gary and Joan, I'm talking to you, I received a DVD copy of the movie, and I have to confess that it really wasn't that bad. Arch Jr. does an acceptable job of essaying the title character, although you get the urge to slap the little troll bald-headed about ten minutes into the first on-screen appearance. Marilyn Manning is effective as a Judy, Richard Arland is good as a tormented teacher unable to defend himself and his friends, and everyone else is serviceable enough. The real strength of the movie is attention present throughout due to the taut direction of James Landis and aided immeasurably by the excellent cinematography of Vilmos Zygmunt. This, along with the shockingly, for the time, downbeat ending, makes for an interesting low-budget experience worth seeing at least once. I myself have watched it a couple of times since receiving my own copy, and it gets better with every viewing. Sort of. So right now, sit back, relax, and get in touch with your inner masochist as you watch The Sadist, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema. <laughs>